Gilgamesh and the Bible. A lot of talk is given to Gilgamesh in the young earth worldview. Let's explore him now. Where and when was Gilgamesh? What are the major points of the story of Gilgamesh? Who in the Bible was alive when Gilgamesh was alive? Let's answer all these questions. Here is the city of Uruk. Gilgamesh is king here. And he believes his task is to beat people who aren't working to his standards. It is his job to mate with every woman on their wedding day, defend the city against the other supergenetic humans, and go on raids to steal goodies from other cities. Gilgamesh wants to convince all people what a great king he is. And we're left with this epic. The story starts out in Uruk mentioning the seven sages. Perhaps the seven sages are related to the Mahabharata of India. Gilgamesh is mentioned as the fifth king of Uruk and being a ruthless slave driver. In the Akkadian tradition of polytheism, the heavenly powers have mercy on the workers of Uruk by sending a country giant named Enkidu to the city giant named Gilgamesh. Outside the city, an animal trapper is frightened by Enkidu's 17-foot figure and runs to the city to tell Gilgamesh. So Gilgamesh sends Shamhat, the prostitute, out who succeeds in seducing Enkidu. Enkidu goes into the city and meets Gilgamesh. We get a description of Enkidu being just like Gilgamesh, and Gilgamesh reaching the battlements of the walls of Uruk. The walls of Uruk are 20 feet tall. The battlements are the top three feet of that wall, so Gilgamesh and Enkidu are 17 feet tall. The two protagonists here set out on a quest to get the cedars of the great cedar forest. Now, Gilgamesh and Enkidu travel from Uruk at a speed of 50 leagues per day for three days. Now, a league is three miles, so this is 450 miles. This data is consistent with going to the area of the cedars of Lebanon. At the forest, there is a monster named Humbaba who protects the forest. So our two heroes do what jerk tyrant kings do. They kill Humbaba, enabling them to cut down the trees. They immediately take a number of the wondrous 100-foot-tall trees and float them down the Euphrates back to the plain of Shinar. Now they are jumping for joy. They're ecstatic in triumph, dreaming of what treasures the trees will be made into. Uh, the protagonist Gilgamesh and Enkidu travel back to their home in Uruk. Due to this victory, a character called Ishtar, that the Akkadians call a goddess, wishes to seduce Gilgamesh. But in keeping with his own rude character, Gilgamesh insults Ishtar, making her very angry. She schemes for Gilgamesh to get killed by running him down with the bull of heaven. But Enkidu saves the day by gaining control of the bull. So this infuriates Ishtar. So she sends sickness to Enkidu and he dies. Now Gilgamesh, who has always scoffed at death, is now outraged. But now that he has seen a big shot like himself die, he changes his tune and wishes to find immortality. Now a second journey is started by Gilgamesh. The Genesis survivor of the flood, Noah, is named Utnapishtim, and the Akkadians believe he is immortal. So Gilgamesh wishes to ask him how to attain immortality. The details of going on the quest to find Utnapishtim are given to us, but for your information, the distance is difficult to follow. Gilgamesh doesn't spare any time. He runs as fast as he can from the city of Uruk to the mountain passes at nightfall. There are desert scorpion beings that tell him he will fail and he shouldn't even try. He should turn back. But Gilgamesh keeps on going. After all, it, it is the epic of Gilgamesh. He goes towards the mountain that is so high only the heaven is higher. He crosses mountains, goes through darkness, gets onto the road of the sun. He passes an area that has precious gems everywhere. The north wind and the sun beat against his face. After making it through all that tough terrain, he then meets Siduri, the tavern keeper. 
At this point, I fully expected him to kill this lady, but Gilgamesh is tired and so doesn't have his normal temper tantrum, and she is surprisingly left unharmed. So she directs Gilgamesh to the boatman named Uthanapishtim, who hangs out by the broad sea. Now, Gilgamesh heads towards the boat of the boatman and doesn't see the boatman. So Gilgamesh has a tantrum. He destroys the mechanisms on the boat, showing his great displeasure. The boatman meets Gilgamesh and asks him, What do you want? Gilgamesh says, I want to cross the sea to find Utnapishtim. Now the boatman laughs at him and tells him, The things on the boat you just destroyed, those enable you to safely pass by on the broad sea and the waters of death. <laughs> so the boatman tells him he needs to cut down a bunch of trees to make safety tools so he can compensate for the mechanisms Gilgamesh just destroyed. The trees will keep him from dying when going over the waters of death. So the two of them make the boat journey and come upon Utnapishti and his wife. Now Gilgamesh is surprised that Noah or Utnapishtim is just like him, flesh and bone. He expected some special feature of immortality. Well, Noah tells Gilgamesh he can't attain immortality, but he can get a medicine plant that helps. The final paragraphs of the Epic of Gilgamesh start his return to Uruk. Gilgamesh dives into the water and gets this special plant. Then he takes a rest and a snake snatches the plant away. So empty-handed, Gilgamesh finishes the boat voyage to Uruk. Gilgamesh claims he has learned to be a better king and starts the task of helping make water wells for his people and unblocking the mountain passes. So there it is, folks. I have wondered extensively if it is possible to find places where Noah was. From the description in the epic, I don't know how far Gilgamesh went, but it was far enough that he thought it was epic, and the Akkadians thought the story was one of the paramount stories of all time. So perhaps Noah went to India or Southeast Asia, China, or even Alaska. If you have a guess where Noah went, be sure to leave it in the comments section. I'd love to hear your thoughts on this. So this journey intrigues me. Since there were no GPS maps 4,300 years ago, if you head the wrong way into the mountains or deserts, you would not come out. You would become a Neanderthal skeleton, and a modern evolutionist priest would date your skeleton to have been 50,000 years old. Genesis certainly has Noah around Ararat. The Book of Jubilees has Noah by the Persian Gulf, and the Epic of Gilgamesh has Noah somewhere east of Iraq, along some shore across some sea, a sea that Gilgamesh spent three days crossing. Now, if the Epic of Gilgamesh is a valid document, it gives us some insight into life after the flood. Now, let's look at Gilgamesh within the bounds of the Hebrew record. We get information about the existence of giants in the book of Genesis, Numbers, Deuteronomy, Joshua, Samuel, and 1 Chronicles. Genesis 6-4 states, There were giants in the earth in those days and also after that. In the Masoretic text, the flood was about 2,500 B.C. The Akkadian flood description is consistent with the Hebrew flood description. Here is a quote from Atrahasis. The earth was inundated with the power and noise of the flood. Notice the words, the earth was inundated. This shows us that the Akkadians agree with Genesis that the flood was worldwide. Now, all the priests of evolution will put a special note here that states, Pay no attention to the historical text or geological flood layers of sedimentary rock that are hundreds to thousands of feet thick and cover whole continents. In their religion of evolutionism, it is imperative that you don't believe a worldwide flood ever happened. Now, as a chemist, I can't dismiss history and science to sell out my soul for money and their acceptance. I truly believe a worldwide flood happened. 
If world flood myths are researched, the flood dates range from 2200 BC to 3000 BC. The Masoretic text has the flood at about 2500 BC, and I'm working from this vantage point. So let's move on from this controversy. In Genesis 10, we read about Nimrod. Verse 10 states, And the beginning of his kingdom was Babel, and Erech, and Akkad, and Kalna, in the land of Shinar. Gilgamesh appears on the Sumerian king's list as having ruled Uruk. To gain the understanding of time and the relationship with the Bible, we need to know that the Sumerian king's list has pre-flood and post-flood cities. Uruk, it corresponds to Erech of Nimrod in Genesis 10. In the Epic of Gilgamesh, the Akkadians are worshiping Noah as a god. They think he is immortal. They have made a distinction between people who are supposed gods and people who are mortal. Now, throughout this time period, the world is learning that the original stock, Noah, Shem, Ham, Japheth, Nimrod, Gilgamesh, etc., have pretty good genetics. But the newer stock are weak, frail, small, and susceptible to diseases. Two classes of people immediately developed the Gilgamesh-type tyrant bully king, and the plebeian slaves. In the Book of Jubilees, the earth is mapped, and Noah distributed the inheritance of earth to Shem, Ham, and Japheth at the birth of Peleg. That's 2359 BC. If you wish, see my video on who was Peleg, generation 15. Now, Nimrod wasn't happy with the land distribution and starts the Tower of Babel. In Genesis 11, we learn about the Tower of Babel event when God confounded the languages, 2354 BC. Gilgamesh is most likely living on this planet at this time. The biblical people alive at this time are Noah, Shem, Arphaxad, Selah, Eber, Peleg, Ru, Sarig, Nahor, Terah, and perhaps even Abraham. The people born from generation 11 to 15 did pretty well regarding longevity. Now, Manu is the Hindu Indian version of Noah. And in the Mahabharata, Manu has 50 children after the flood. So Shem, Ham, and Japheth would have had many children we don't see listed in the table of nations. Now, Nimrod is generation 13, and Gilgamesh is probably after Nimrod, equivalent to Eber, Peleg, or Ru, generation 14 to 16. In the epic, Gilgamesh starts out thinking he's invincible, and it is probably because the genetics hadn't been degraded. Because of these long lives, many people in the post-flood world didn't know what death was, but they started finding out. They may have heard about death when they started tyrannizing each other, so people died of violent causes. But they may not have known that people could die of natural causes, or if they did, they didn't know what it looks like. Gilgamesh seems to have the attitude that he is strong, death will never reach him. Through the epic, he sees his friend Enkidu die, and he changes his mind. He gets super depressed and goes on this epic, and we get to read a conversation between Noah and someone not listed in the Bible from a source outside the Bible. Now, of the patriarchs in Genesis, Peleg dies first, 2120 B.C., Nahor, 2119 B.C., and Noah, 2110 B.C. The giant Gilgamesh is living probably 2300 or 2200 B.C., and it confirms information in the Bible. Now, the Bible has many instances of giants in it, the book of Numbers, Deuteronomy, Joshua, Samuel, and Chronicles list other instances of giants that correspond to the life of Moses and Joshua in 1400 BC, also David in 1000 BC. In my Protestant worldview, I am intrigued by the idea of giants since Genesis states there were giants before the flood and after. The 17-foot size of Gilgamesh, Enkidu, and Noah fascinate me. These biblical ideas make it easy for me to believe the ancient people could do greater things than we have been programmed to believe. I've often wondered the travel speed. 
of a determined, healthy, 17-foot-tall, genetically superior person who lived 4,300 years ago. The rate listed in the epic is 150 miles per day. So when I see the Great Pyramids and more of the ancient world, I am not startled at all. It is only if you listen to the modern priests of evolution that you would think these things impossible. If in the world there are anomalies like giants and catastrophes like Gilgamesh and the Flood, then the present is not the key to the past. Therefore, our assumptive mathematical models based on the present are not reliable. So now let's pull it all together. Let's integrate all this exciting information. Through it all, we have a loose confirmation of the Bible through the Sumerian king list. Atrahasis, Enuma Elish, and the Epic of Gilgamesh. These are just sources obtained from the Hebrews, Assyrians, and Akkadians. Just think of what interesting thing we can find when we take a look at the Celts, the Greeks, the Medes, the Egyptians, the Cushites, Indians, Chinese, and more. This is all so exciting, and I hope you learned as much as I did. I leave you with this quote from Frederick the Great. My people and I have come to an agreement which satisfies us both. They are to say what they please, and I am to do what I please. I bet he took lessons from Gilgamesh. It's always free to thumbs up, share, comment, and subscribe. Have a great week, and I will see you in the next video.